So um, I'm a whippersnapper at university from Scotland, coming after St Andrews, clearly. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about Big Bang or marginal gains, driving innovation and change. So I'm going to sort of talk about three particular things. I'm going to talk about our campus master plan, which is a huge sort of Big Bang investment. Some of the actual physical space refurbishment work we've just completed in last year at the university library, but also... Um, a little bit about our repository, Enlighten, as well, because I can't talk to anyone without talking about Enlighten and our repository. I think it's in my contract. Um, but actually, I want to pitch Enlighten not just as a repository, but as an innovation engine, and I'll come back to I'll come back to that. So this is an exciting time to be working in a research library. By exciting, I mean challenging. Um, research libraries were in perpetual beta. Um, you know, whether it's carpentry or otherwise. And I think we look at the sort of shifting, sta the shifting sands of all the, the technical, the research, the political landscape um, that we're really sort of working against. And we have to sort of look at how we can make that headspace to innovate and actually make sure that we try and stay ahead of the curve and continue to look at how we add that value. And I think as well in the climate of declining budgets and increasing costs, what are some of the tools and the approaches you know, that we can take to help us continue to create that headspace and deliver that? And I think it's really important as well, this is a further disclaimer, this is not a, a, a sort of a management theory talk, um, although I'm talking a little bit about Big Bang and so on. I was really stuck as well, the conference opened, um, and Carolyn Brazier was talking about having space to think. And I think putting together this presentation, being able to come down to work with colleagues to actually you know, engage with all these, you know, this RLUK 17 conference has been a fantastic opportunity to think about that. It gives us an idea to sort of, you know, are there any, you know, for us, are there any silver bullets um, which we can use to sort of look at big bang or big buck changes, you know, that we're looking at, you know, things that can deliver our new services or some of the sort of marginal gain approaches where we can aggregate, you know, even at a small level, you know, how we can start to deliver that. So this is my spoiler alert. So the answer is, um, I think it's a blend. So I don't think there is, no, there is no black and white. I think depending on the funding, depending on our situations and so on. Um, it, but that blend itself is a challenge. So we're going to look a little bit at what's worked um, at Glasgow and you know, how we've sort of taken things, uh, taken things forward. So, you know, we're in the British Library. I'm looking forward to going to see this, uh, this exhibition. And I think it would contend innovation is about creating and shaping our collective future. Okay, now that can range from, you know, getting staff to engage with us with simple uh, suggestion boxes, incremental changes, to the much bigger seismic Big Bang. And, it, you know, it's been said that certainly for um, industry, Big Bang innovation is something akin to political revolution. So I'm not here to ferment political revolution, um, but I think it's something that we really need to, to keep in mind. And I think when we're looking at managing change, managing those innovations, we need to think about not only what we're going to change, but actually what we want to keep. Because we do a lot of really good things that really, really work. So, you know, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, but also look at how best we can align with our institutional strategy. Um, I am a librarian. I think I just need to get that out there. Um, <laughs> However, you know, looking at the top trends, um, the ACRL last year, it was fascinating to look at research data services, data management plans, um, altmetrics, scholarship, um, looking at the, the needs of emerging new positions. And I was particularly struck by this, this quote at the bottom, collaboration, teamwork, and communication are most common across all the position descriptions. There are things that librarians are really good at, the things that librarians in concert you know, with other colleagues, I think are really good at and can help us provide some value add. So we go from there to Big Bang, okay? So the 1960s, um, that was one of the sort of last times on the university campus where we had a sort of university, you know, a Big Bang in terms of, you know, change. And we're really preparing now for our next innovative shift. Our campus master plan has been approved by the city council. You know, we are looking at a billion pounds worth of investment over the coming years, a whole slew of new buildings, um, new opportunities um, for us, 
And I think it's probably going to be the biggest change in 150 years since the campus moved to the leafy West End. So you can see we had lots of buildings built in the 1960s, uh, including the library itself in 1968. So as we look ahead to next year, that will be 50 years that we'll have been um, in that building, um, and a building itself which is in sort of perpetual beta. And I think for the university, it's about kind of modern ambition. These aren't our buildings, and I'm not going to quiz you on, you know, can you identify these? But it's good to aspire. It's good to actually look at that. So we can see those major changes. We can look at new centers of gravity with new buildings um, and so on. And it's, as I say, it's going to be, you know, one of the biggest educational infrastructure projects in Scotland's history. Um, so I think we have a lot of investment um, in this, and the library has a key role kind of to play in this. These are the university's strategic and priorities for it, you know, looking at activities, students, and enhancing student experience, income growth, um, efficiencies, um, and improving the condition of our estate. And a key part of that um, is going to be learning and teaching hub, which will be established um, in the first phase um, of that. Um, our university librarian, Susan Ashworth, is leading the staff and student experience workshop for this learning and teaching hub, and that's about creating capacity for future growth, again, enhancing that student experience. Um, we will have more space, I will predict, at the moment, it will open, it will be full, um, and we'll need to look at the next thing, because you can never have, a bit like PCs in the library, it seems you can never have enough space. However, I think it's an important commitment to that student experience, and a really important commitment to that. And also, I think it's not going to be owned by any particular service, but the opportunity for the library to sort of inform and engage with that. So again, we have some sort of you know nice artist impressions of, of how that will look. Um, it's really important for us to work in partnership um, with the, the the local you know the local area. You know with um, you know with the campus itself out, out in the West End. You know looking at ways in which you know we can contribute to that. Um, again, here we have it here, many happy students, many happy future students here in our learning and teaching hub. I don't see any of them on the escalators yet, mind you, but nonetheless, happy students in our learning and teaching hub. So I think this is sort of a, an indicator. We have a new research um, hub coming on stream as well. We're looking at moving um, you know, other parts of our colleges. So these are exciting times. However, back at base, um, in our 1968 Perpetual Beta building, um, this was a couple of years ago. This was a really big step change for us. This is a, commonly referred to as our glass box. So this is um, our high demand collection. You can see sort of peeping off to the one side, some really nice, um, nice red booths. And what's been really important for us is looking at how we can drive some of that change and really bring the library up into the 21st century and look at matching those expectations. Students today have very different expectations when I went to university many, many, many years ago. Um, and I think an element about that is evidence is incredibly important. Whether we're looking at marginal gains, whether we're looking at that big bang, um, being able to actually you know, take the time to invest in things like ethnographic studies have been utterly invaluable for us. Great opportunity to follow students around the building with their permission, um, you know, to do those focus groups, to get all that sort of engagement. And it's qualitative data, okay? It's more than just um, you know, the kind of things that um, you know, you'd uh, just get through um, perhaps emails or um, you know, tick boxes or so on. It is really important qualitative data. And it was incredibly invaluable. And it really sort of shone a light on how the students feel about the library space, how the students feel, you know, at home. There's that sense of ownership for them and so on, which was very, very exciting. So our big bang in the last year was uh, 3.5 million um, brackets on budget. Uh, level one and two refurbishments, okay? This was three interlocking pieces of work. So it was looking at opening up completely new student space, developing um, some existing space, um, and also doing some work with um, staff areas. So we have a new bespoke conservation suite, um, new areas for digitization, and new opportunities for um, seating and so on. And just down at the bottom there, gender neutral toilets. Very controversial. We have apparently the largest set of gender neutral toilets on campus at the moment. Students very happy. Um, so 
it was one of the things that, and I, I, I'm big flipping, but actually it's really important because one of the drivers for the refurbishment is to look at what will work you know, in terms of all the various elements that will inform the learning and teaching hub as well. So you can see that connective tissue with the library around sort of helping to shape these sort of environments. Again, more happy students. We have a range of flex. One of the things that we had the opportunity to do in this space was really look at different types of furniture, different areas. Um, we have a, a sort of seating space where student societies and so on can actually now use some of that space. We've put in lots of flexible furniture. We've tried to sort of zone the area in lots of sort of interesting ways. I particularly like this. I would have this table in my house. This is a really nice table. Um, so we've, you know, we've zoned some of it. It's got, some of it has this really, really sort of nice clubby feel. We've gone for a little single seater, you know, booths. You know, library opens at 7 a.m. You know, by 7 to 8 p.m., uh, 8 a.m. rather, those little single booths are really, you know, they're full. Students absolutely love them. And just sort of juxtaposed next to that is, you know, the, the stairway down to level one, a refurbished space that was storage area. Um, that has, and there's the stairs going back up again. Uh, so again, this is probably slightly less sexy, less exciting, but incredibly busy. Um, we've only got... Um, so that was an additional 150 uh, sp spaces that we added. Um, we weren't going to put PCs in there because you can never have enough PCs. Um, although we now have about 30 PCs. So there's about a fifth, a fifth of that space um, has some PCs. And as I say, it's, it's very busy. It's self-policing. It's been interesting to see. We didn't, we zoned different parts of the library building. And I think for us during this first year in particular, it was a sort of, you know, let's see how the students use, you know, use this space. And for them, there has been a degree of self-regulating and really they are sort of policing themselves. That is a much quieter zone. Um, upstairs um, is probably a bit more active. It is the entrance level. Um, but I think what's interesting about um, upstairs as well um, is we probably need to come in, to come in the middle of the night sometimes and move some of our flexible furniture around. We bought lots of furniture with wheels and students don't seem to be quite comfortable with moving that around yet. Um, we've talked to other colleagues around, you know, around that and I think that's just you know, for them part of that transition about you know, the ownership and around that space. Um, big empty room, it's now full. Um, so this is um, part of our conservation suite. Um, and one of the most favourite things that we got to order for the, the um, for the project, which is the pantograph luminaires, which are the lights which are on the on the tracks here. So they go up and down and left and right, so that our conservation staff can really focus on the work uh, the work that they're doing. Um, and we've also sort of creatively found ways of because you never have enough power. You can never have enough power either for students. Power and Wi-Fi, it's like that Maslow hierarchy of needs. So also in level two, we have creatively put in a lot of power um, through, the, uh, through the ceiling so they can sort of pull that down. They've creatively pulled them in directions we didn't expect, but that's kind of what happens. You know, you put the space in and then, this, you, know, and then you add people. You know, so, um, however, it isn't just about the sort of physical space. This was our old desk. It's about a new service model. It's about bringing the staff along with us um, so that it's, you know, bringing that culture. We had this old, you know, um, you know, very old sort of desk. It was a fantastic magnet for cues. So we've sort of moved away from that now to, you know, we've got a, a really great sort of welcome desk here. Look, at, look how happy that member of staff is. Okay. <laughs> Okay, the one above, not so happy, but that's clearly, you know, getting there. Um, so above that is a, a sort of pop-up information point. It's quite mobile. Um, we now have, you know, collocated a lot more of our, um, the self-issue machines and so on. And, and here on the left in the welcome desk, we brought our library services um, and our library security kind of staff together. So we're looking at sort of different ways of, uh, you know, of working, of engaging with the students. And I think it was really important because actually library services and the, the, the leadership role there worked very hard to bring, you know, the staff along with us and that they were fully consulted and they were fully engaged in kind of how we do that. So I'm going to say a little bit as contractually obligated, enlighten. Um, so innovation 
so this is, I think, is our innovation engine. Um, you know, we can look at this. We now have, you know, we started as we all did with publications. We've moved into research data. I'm dreadfully envious of St. Andrews and the work that you're now doing, moving into, you know, software and so on around that. But I think this is incredibly, um, you know, important opportunity for us to have a look at all the different things. And I was sort of looking, looking at that, and again, almost with marginal gains, you can see there were little things that we've done over the years, which now as you take a step back, have really sort of aggregated into this incredibly embedded system, which is sort of core to all manner of things. And it isn't just about compliance, and I know there were you know, some comments about that, that yesterday, but I think, you know, Ideal, idealistically, it is for us, it is still about open access. It's about showcasing our research, it's being able to curate that research, and it's about being able to push things forward. You know, looking at how we can embed um, orchids and deal with that pesky problem of author disambiguation. Although, having said that, with, with compliance, you know, here's our ref compliance tool. We like to buck the trend at Glasgow, so we don't actually have a commercial CRIS system. Um, we sort of continue to focus very much on our, um, our ePrint service, focus on um, some of our kind of local developments. And this has given us lots of opportunities to be fairly nimble um, around this. This has been developed by Will Fison at, um, um, at Southampton. So we use this as the basis here. Um, we have a, a lovely little sort of, you know, tick box here when you're adding that. Congratulations, this item complies with the REF policy. So there's lots of uh, elements within the workflow around that. But we're now working in partnership with the research office around our REF exercise. So we're using the repository again for staff to start making those selections, giving us an idea about what we're actually selecting. And one of the things that we wanted to do about that is we've got a re I've got we implemented a traffic light system so that they could immediately see how compliant any of the selections that they actually made. We weren't going to tell them that's not what you could make, but it continues to open that dialogue and I think it just sort of keeps that keeps that momentum going around um, compliance and so on. So you can see here I've you know, these are totally randomly selected, but they turned out I, we're, being very, we're being very, very eligible just now because I find it quite hard to find ones that weren't. Um, so these have all got very happy green sort of traffic lights. And it's, it's a very, very small change, but it's actually made a phenomenal difference in terms of engaging with staff around, you know, around this process. Um, and here we stripped down what we actually wanted from them. Really, we're only asking for some rationale in terms of all of that. So we've stripped right back many of the hundreds of fields that we know and love from the REF. So we don't want to make it kind of difficult. Um, and for the Enlightened team, there's lots of opportunities to flag, you know, what panel this could be returned to, um, the exceptions and so on as well. So I think um, that innovation engine for us has been incredibly important in engaging staff and also enabling us to build lots of reports that makes our life, <coughs> pardon me, much, much easier in terms of that engagement with staff. So we get these sent out um, to the colleges every month. Um, I think they are very sort of appreciative of it. They can sort of be that canary in a coal mine. So it is really important to have that, that sort of dialogue. And I think with our branding, Enlighten isn't synonymous with just big stick and compliance. You know, Enlighten is a service for our academic colleagues, working in partnership with them to showcase and highlight our material. So I want to say, just in the, the last couple of slides, so how have we got there? Or how are we getting there? And how are we still sort of moving forward? And I think a key component of that is, if I do say so ourselves, our, our kind of leadership team. So here we have our university librarian um, in the center. And I think having around that, we have a sort of very flat collegiate senior management uh, structure, we have academic engagement, we have digital strategy, sort of an infrastructure, we have collections, we have student engagement. And those portfolios have really given us um, a lot more scope to look at how we sort of further develop and take, take our work forward. Um, talking about changing staff profiles as well, with my hashtag, I am a librarian. Um, 
you know, we have introduced, you know, we have an RD, we have a research data management team, none of whom are librarians. We have a learning technologist. Um, at the moment on maternity leave, our new assistant director for student engagement has actually come to us from the student services department and is really helping us to deepen and broaden relationships with student services. Um, but I think in amongst all of that, in recent, you know, over the last, you know, six months, we have also appointed two new college librarians. So we're not all about the new sexy, ah, uh, it's, you know, not librarians. We've appointed new college librarians, new college librarians who can work with us to upskill into spaces, you know, around the bibliometrics, around the, you know, the altmetrics and so on. But they're also working in partnership around a new um, sort of committee structure that we're looking at, which will help us deliver you know, the library's research strategy. So they, these all feed into the senior management team, um, particularly like library futures. Um, so, you know, we will be looking at, you know, successions to our LMS, you know, looking at, you know, other challenges around discovery and so on. So there's a range of, of, of kind of elements here. This reminded me of one of those Stephen Covey fire within sort of type diagrams. But actually, I think that's true. You know, it's about that, that sort of motivation and that innovation. And again, you can't do that without the library strategy. Here's our pillars of our library strategy. And I think the only thing I want to flag about that is we brought the library staff with us. This was actually co-created with library staff. We had an open invitation. All staff were encouraged to actually um, come and attend you know, with us and really work with us so that it is sort of a collective, uh, you know, collective strategy. So... I think our experience, innovation and change, it's not clear cut, it's challenging, but you know, it's worth it because we can't stand still. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. You know, we're gonna make mistakes. The trick is actually what we learn from those mistakes so we make different mistakes next time. You know, one size won't fit all, but actually having different uh, approaches, being open to whether it's big bang or marginal gains, given those, having those in our tool set or toolbox is really important. We need to bring staff with us, okay? We cannot deliver this without staff. We need to nurture and further our key partnerships, okay? That's absolutely critical, whether it's IT services, um, whether it is, uh, you know, the students themselves and so on. We need to make opportunities for consultation. And when we do that consultation, we need to act on it. That can't just be a tick box exercise. And at the end of the day as well, don't underestimate the importance of just having a suggestion box. You know, and by suggestion box, I mean having an open door, you know, people, you know, having a culture where, you know, staff can say, you know, if we tweak this or change this, could we make a difference? Yes, I believe we can. So I think, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, thank you. Okay.